Uh, Sean, are you there? Can you hear me? I am here. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, oh man, we are running the table. This is great. <laughs> Very what exciting. Is, what a great day for Twitter Spaces. <laughs> and the recording is working. Uh, okay, I'm knocking on wood right now because we're, yeah, we're obviously steering ourselves toward, towards a later Twitter Spaces catastrophe. Uh, so, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Adam and I are so excited to, to have you here. Um, Adam, I know you, you had not yet read this book when I was raving about it. I know you've, you've read it now. No, I, I slammed through it. It is such a page turner. It is just fantastic, like b- both in terms of connecting to topics that we've discussed. It's an awesome story of technology. And a lot of it felt pretty close to home, like having, having lived through these periods and seen a, a lot of the things. So getting the inside baseball was awesome, Sean. Absolutely awesome. No, thank you. Yeah. So- Thank you very much. And so this is just losing the signal by by Jackie McNish and by you, Sean, and uh, just terrific, so well written, um, an incredible story. And I also got to tell you the question that I'm that I'm dying to ask you because I went back. Adam, have you seen the Spanish Prisoner, the David Mamet film? Yes, yes, yes. One of my favorites. Okay. So for those who have not seen the Spanish Prisoner, there is. Did we see it together? Maybe we saw it together. That's uh, not impossible in Petro Hill. Yeah, uh, back in the day, yeah, yeah. Mo- yeah. Movie night, circa, you know, like 2000, 2001, I guess, yeah, 2002. Yeah. Um, but there is a... Tw- Sean, have you seen The Spanish Prisoner by David Mamet? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, well, good film. And there is a big twist at the end that makes you want to immediately rewatch the entire film. And the And I don't think it's giving away too much by saying that. And I kind of feel I went back and reread some of the rise of Rim, and I had that same feeling where I was all of a sudden having read your vivid portrayal of the fall of Rim, going back and rereading the rise, I was seeing all of this detail that I had missed. And I'm kind of dying to ask you now, did you see any of those parallels as you're writing it? Where, and because in particular, here's the parallel I'm dying to ask you about. It feels like Rim itself was playing the role of the iPhone with Bell South playing the role that AT&T would later play where Rim does this thing that everyone else thinks is impossible, namely wireless email and disrupts the entire industry. And I feel so, I see so many parallels with what the iPhone would do, you know, eight years later. I, I think you can argue that Rim created the playbook that, uh, well, <laughs> it also created the playbook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well played. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, 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 it wrote the, it wrote the script that I think Apple probably perfected with, um, you know, with lessons learned, uh, both from the mistakes and blind spots Rim had, but also the failures that Silicon Valley had um, um, had, you know, the mistakes Silicon Valley had made that Rim was able to capitalize on or sort of uh, deke around, uh, as it were. So I, I, I think, I, and and it's actually interesting. I think I don't think Rim gets enough credit for a lot of the things it did. It's sort of a forgotten tech company for a lot of people, but. You know, I think about the way that a lot of uh, software is uh, sold nowadays. Slack's an example. And, you know, that was a playbook that was quite novel um, that RIM sort of put into play in terms of, you know, infiltrating the uh, the enterprise uh, and not going through the CIOs. Office. They totally did. And I, I mean, and maybe you want to actually expand a little bit on that, because I know, Tom, you had made that, that comment earlier today about how genius it was that they did infiltrate the C-suite. Michael Dell's a customer. I mean, it was a great way of getting the, the product out there. Because it, it, it feels like they, they made the product essential at kind of the top levels of the company um, and it, it going in through a very, uh, a very viral path, but it, a very effective path as well uh, because they, they were creating something. And actually, you know, on that note, you've got this great anecdote about a rim engineer being in San Francisco and wanting, needing directions and being able to get it over email and having like the light bulb go off. How much, do you mind if I ask like how much, you know, you've got some, uh, how many kind of uh, narrative uh, license you were taking there versus like, because it sounds like that was an important moment. 
Well, that, you know, I think what made this story really sing for us and, and, and what we really wanted to bring out, like this is a book we wanted to resonate as much with, let's say the, you know, typical listeners of, uh, of, of this group as with, you know, our aunts or uncles or sisters or brothers around the Christmas table. You know, we thought there was a lot of little great little stories that uh, told the bigger story. Um, You know, it was funny, like we were writing a book about tech and we were trying to write as little about tech as possible while trying to be credible with techies, but not sort of lose the average reader. And so a lot of these little moments along the way really illustrated, I, I think, a lot of the, the the kind of human drama and and some of those aha moments. Like one of my favorite passages in the book is um, is about the um, is about the birth of BBM because nobody had ever told that story. And if you think about mm. how much instant messengers, uh, mobile instant messengers, define our life, it, it was amazing to me that these three guys were kind of unknowns. Um, they'd not been heralded. They'd almost been punished. Uh, one of them uh, was was you know actually punished for creating BBM at the time. Um, probably a lot of skunks work skunk working engineers have <laughs> have experienced that kind of uh, you know after the fact. Can you believe that happened? Ism. Um, but you know I love the anecdote about how uh, one of the uh, the co creators of BBM was you know at Disneyland with his uh, I think his uh, mother in law who like didn't even have a feature phone. And she was hooked on BBM and uh, they were, that's all the, the only way they were communicating with each other to find out, like, you know, well, let's meet for ice cream or whatever. And he said, like, this is the moment where I realized that, um, you know, that mobile instant messaging would replace the phone call. And can you imagine, like, like that, that's like, like that's a chance to kind of like almost tell the story about the creation of fire, in, 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 <laughs> in, you know, in, in, in modern terms, you know, because like that's, that's the origin moment. And no one had ever written about that. There was no record of it anywhere. We had to sort of root around and find it. And I, you know, I think every day and every week we were having like these conversations, like, isn't this amazing? Like, like, like we had these stories we wanted to tell that, you know, kind of illustrated and, and, and brought the story to life. I, I loved that anecdote in particular, um, you know, sitting at Disney behind some other dad on the ride, hollering to be heard, um, you know, ruining it for everybody and then being able to send this kind of covert text message, you know, via BBM, which was novel for its time. I, I love that great passage. Well, and I, and I love the mother-in-law at being, you know, kind of accidentally finding herself on the absolute leading edge of technology, not necessarily being aware that this thing is actually not broadly available, that you're one of the only people on the planet who has this kind of instant messaging capability, mobile instant messaging capability. Uh, it's, it's just so great. I, I, yeah, I love that. But, and, you know, the fact that the, the first power user ever of BBM uh, was, you know, Mike Lazaridis' um, uh, assistant. And if you wanted to get to Mike, you had to go through her. And so, you know, th thus begins thus begins the uh, the uh, the huge ride of uh, mobile instant messaging. Yeah. And the thing about the thing of BBM is like it's, it's much later, though, than RIM's initial rise. Right. I mean, because BBM is in is that in 2000 and Seven? Wait, wait, when is BBM actually? Because uh, I feel like it, uh, you're testing my memory now. I think it's around 2004. 2004 or five. Okay. But, okay. But, but I think, but I think there, and 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 this is you talked about the carriers. I mean, this is the state of 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 carriers. Uh, you know, in mid mid 2000s. Um, you know, the first the aughts is that um, you have to sort of sneak. <laughs> you you have to sneak BBM uh, and the first baby browsers that they had in with a you know with a with an update and stick it in through the help menu so that the carriers <laughs> right. catch it. Yeah, I, I loved the sneaky stuff that you described uh Rim doing of uh to to kind of circumvent the restrictions of the carriers, installing the software and then asking forgiveness after the fact. Because that, that seemed to be a pattern. Uh, a pattern sometimes to the delight of everybody and sometimes that really blew up in their face. Yeah. And compare that to tech companies today. They they don't ask for forgiveness after they. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We 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 want them to ask for forgiveness. We, we've, uh, you know. Uh, lawmakers who are trying to force forgiveness on them. But yeah, anyway, that's, uh, I digress. Well, and, and that actually, so th th that dovetails into kind of an interesting question, because as you do kind of get to this unbelievable arc of this rise and, and then fall, um, and I think there's a lot to learn on kind of both halves of that. But one of the things that we saw on in the rise that I, that I personally wondered if we didn't see an echo 
in the fall is the way that they interacted with partners. Um, and, you know, it, it, sometimes it felt kind of like age appropriate, but, so, you know, kind of like startup-y kind of things that you would go do. But other times it clearly left some, some, some more than ruffled feathers. I mean, when they, Bell South thought they had an exclusive deal and then they didn't. Um, and that was, uh, that obviously rankled folks at Bell South. Um, they, you know, the, there was the Nokia deal, um, where they, the rim kind of slow rolled Nokia. Did you, th Sean, did, did those frayed relationships cast a longer shadow or were those kind of startup machinations that were kind of forgotten and didn't play a role in, uh, in what later happened to rim? Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I don't think that, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people who interacted with with Jim didn't necessarily like it. You know, they didn't uh, they found him tough. And, and, you know, who is this who is this little guy with this little company? Oh, well, not little guy, you know, but this guy with this small company kind of acting like a big shot. But I don't think years later, uh, when the wheels were falling off, people held that behavior against them. I think hmm. there's a lot of stories in the business world about people who are not all that pleasant uh, on the way up or at the top. And I, I, I do kind of think in the business world, people like that sort of get a pass um, as long as they're successful, you know, and, and the reasons. So, so one of the things I think BlackBerry put in place in the early days uh, was, you know, charging this uh, service access fee, which, you know, by their height was generating something like 2 billion in revenue. This is like, think, wow. think about a think, think about, it's like a software company today that's generating two billion in revenue with software margins. Like, like think about that. How many companies like that are there today? Not many, even. And um, and and but the problem was that nobody liked paying it. You know, if if you <laughs> an app on the app store, you know, you were, you know, you you got an enjoyable experience out of it. But if you had a BlackBerry, you were, you know, it was like being forced to to eat cod liver oil. And and so nobody liked that. But I I, I don't think that. You know, I, I don't think anyone had particularly long memories at that point or were looking to stick it to rim. I think I think it was just a business decision at that point. Interesting. Yeah. OK, so they but it, I mean, it is also true that I mean, Boston Lee did not uh, it didn't necessarily make friends. Um, so um, but <laughs> that's putting it very mildly. It is putting it very mildly. Yeah. And I and I should say, you know, full disclosure, like I mentioned this last time that I have this crazy intersection with the company i kind of like shoot through this story like a shooting star in that i'm that i the joint was briefly contemplated for an acquisition strangely and i ended up in being in a meeting with boss lee and lazaridis um that was very close to the end so uh as i think as mentioned last time one of them would speak and the other would roll their eyes so very clear that we were and actually adam i went through the mails that we exchanged after that and that they exchanged with us. And Sean, you may be curious to know that RIM themselves likened the company to a house fire. And then they had this strange line that, and we think the joint folks will understand. And I'm not like, is that because joint itself is a house fire or because we are Silicon Valley types who understand the metaphor? I actually, unanswered question, it could be either. Um, <laughs> Um, but the, so it, it definitely saw that, that side, but, um, clearly also, I mean, just that the, 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 the rise and some of the anecdotes you tell as part of that rise, again, I find just riveting and some of these smaller details that you found, um, like the engineer in San Francisco that is emailing correspondents to get map directions in 1999, which is like, that's another one of your, I think, fire moments, right? I mean, yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. And, and, you know, you talk about sort of Jim's sort of um, disagreeableness, um, I guess, in, in meetings and with partners. But, you know, I know an awful lot of people who used to work for him, both him and Mike, and, and they would still, you know, proverbially walk through fire for three yeah, years. Um, yeah, there's a company actually up in Canada called Magnet Forensics. It's a very, uh, very successful um, company. Uh, Jim is the uh, Jim is the chairman now. And uh, that organization is stuffed deep with uh, with BlackBerry people. So and, and you know, uh, the CEO of Sonos was his uh, was his second in command, Patrick Spence. And so you've got a lot of these people who uh, who work for both Jim and Mike, who I think are still, um, you know, speak very fondly of their days and, and of both of them as leaders and, and, and really recognize them for what they were, which were, you know, geniuses 
for a good part of their time at RIM. And, you know, uh, the story turned, obviously, um, once Apple came along with the iPhone. Yeah, the story did turn. And, you know, I, I think one of the, the – the exercises that one does naturally when reading the book, Adam, I'm curious if you did the same, where you're kind of wondering when is the time that you would course correct? Like if you had a time machine, when is the kind of the latest you could arrive and course correct? Because they have a couple of big opportunities to course correct. It, it, Sean, what, what were some of the big opportunities that, that you've, I mean, certainly I got my own inferences from reading the book, but what was your take on, on some of the big opportunities to get, to be able to course correct with respect to Apple? Well, you know, it's interesting because first you look at the, I think it's worth summarizing the opportunities that were lost along the way. I mean, you know, this was still very, very, very early days in the touchscreen phone. And BlackBerry came up with a different idea than the touchscreen we all know today, which was a, a physical touch. You actually pushed the thing down and the entire screen moved down like a giant button because they thought, well, that's the BlackBerry, that's the BlackBerry take on a, on a smartphone. And I think one of the opportunities lost was after that, project flopped and all of them were returned they tried to perfect it so they did a storm yeah. two and a storm three instead of just junking the whole thing and going all in on a on a touch screen and um so so that's one lost opportunity i think i think they had an argument also later on about whether they should fork uh android or whether they should develop their own operating system and you know that was a lost year and sort of not realizing yeah. that the problem wasn't just a a, a, a better browser so i think you sort of watch in slow motion these like the years peel by and to the point where, you know, the BlackBerry 10 operating system comes out six years later. And of course, nobody has six years to respond technologically. But I don't know. I mean, like, I'm actually interested to hear your your take. So I'll give you my armchair quarterback sort of um, like what should RIM do if you can go back and Steve Jobs is on stage. It's January 2007. What what can you do to fix RIM? And I, I've talked to people, um, people who were at the company and others who said, you know, the moment that happened, RIM was dead. Um, maybe. Um, maybe what you do instead, though, is you immediately cleave off a part of the company in true innovators still in the fashion. You take advantage of a high stock price and maybe you raise a billion or two and buy, a, you know, a, a decent, um, so, you know, bring in a, a full software company, buy yeah, a software company, yeah, yeah. give it to them and then say, come hell or high water, we need a, you know, we need a response to this within, you know, X period of time. Because you have to remember that Android, I mean, Android's ascendance does more to sort of deliver the fatal kill shot to, to, to RIM than Apple. I mean, Apple's sort yeah. of, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and, and Android you'll probably remember was far from a sure thing at the time. I mean, all the telcos were a little freaked out about Google after it bid on Spectrum. Its first phone didn't work out that well. I mean, it's very possible if things had gone a little differently. And then, you know, they found a Hail Mary partner in Motorola, which was, right. you know, floundering at the time, and they come out with a droid. But, you know, if those things don't line up, then maybe we're all laughing at, you know, another failed Google product. But, you know, the naysayers like to pull out every so often. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, you know, <laughs> and laugh, at the, laugh at the second or third most valuable company in the world because, you know, they've had a handful of, you know, not so great successes. That could have been one of them. And then, yeah. you know, until Android. And, but the thing is, Android then very quickly cements its its stranglehold on the sort of non-Apple um, area of the market and just starts you know, knocking off all the other uh, players like Palm and so on. So, so who knows? I mean, RIM maybe has like an 18 to two year window to get things right. And it took them six years. And by then, you know, the circumstances just were not there for, for them to succeed. Yeah. Your analysis in the book describing how, you know, Apple and Google had all these other ways of monetizing. And in particular, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, RIM was getting $2 billion a year, basically a kind of cream off the top. Whereas Google was giving all the carriers the 30% from the app store. Like RIM didn't have these complimentary businesses. Yeah. I mean, do you want to pay 10 bucks in protection money or do you want to pay <laughs> bucks and, and get a question on a coffee? You know, it's like. <laughs> right. Well, and it's, it's so interesting that you ask about the kind of, you so from whatever it's worth from my perspective, I don't think RIM was dead when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone. I think that I, I put the, the time as being definitely after that. I do think that the storm is really critical and God, I, I mean, you're telling of the storm. I, I don't even remember the storm coming out. First of all, I, I don't like, so I am 
not a, I was not a Blackberry or a Rim customer. I don't remember the storm at all, but your telling of the storm is so vivid that and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the only one. I, I want one. I actually want to have, <laughs> I want to lay hands on it. I want to lay, I want to, I want to use it. I want it like the, just because, and I did end up like watching a bunch of online reviews of it and the, uh, and then reading, uh, you know, the YouTube comments on it for even, you know, for, for its time we're we're lighting the thing up. Um, the storm definitely was a, a very important moment for them that they really needed to get right. And they definitely screwed it up. And I feel that though they, so Sean, one of the, the ways that, that I feel that they screwed it up and would, would love to get your per- perspective on this, you know, this is a company that had really uh, pushed its engineering team hard a lot. And, but they pushed the engineering team even harder for the storm and inside a rim, there was a, a lot of malcontent around how hard they were pushing folks and that they were rushing this thing to market when it was not up to rim's quality standards. So the storm was not just kind of ill-conceived. It was misimplemented in a way that, that, that I think conveys panic from rim where they were kind of go. I mean, because it was, the, you know, one of the stories you tell Sean is that their own testing lab found these really serious problems but they shipped it anyway. It, 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 how did v- folks at RIM feel about that? I mean, did they, th- I- am I right, first of all, to read in that much malcontent around how Storm was shipped inside of RIM? No, well, I, first of all, I want to give uh, credit to my uh, co-author, Jackie, who, who actually wrote that chapter. And I, I thought that, I mean, it's one of the pinpoint chapters of the, uh, of, of the book. But, you know, I think you know, I think there was probably a, a general sense of unease. Like this was a this was a company where things were always there's a great line. I think you know it was always like incoming. You know, the shells were always being launched into rim, and this was just another one of those. And you know, that there have been years and years of you know, you're right. You have to meet this deadline. You have to make this this trackball work. Um, and and they've had one challenge after another. And I think this one just had sort of it was just one thing too many, but. You know, at least before they'd been iterating with not that much competition, you know, they didn't have to worry yes. about things like the operating system. Like, like, is the operating system sufficient? Of course it is. You know, is the email sufficient? Of course it is. Do we have to worry about a, um, do we have to worry about an app store? No, because, you know, an app store in 2006 is, you know, three ringtones and Mindbreaker, you know, or, <laughs> right. or Minesweeper. Right. Minesweeper. I, I, I spent a few hours on Minesweeper, I'll, I'll confess. But, um <laughs> right for those of us who actually remember the thing and so i think um you know it's just that perfect combination of 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 it's too much change it's too much of a jump and 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 they're also you know i think the fatal flaw of of the storm is they're saying well we're just doing another blackberry and so this is the again this is the touch screen version of a blackberry people love using clickable phones they love the sensation of clicking something down so we're going to give them that and and what they weren't saying was, well, you know, we're going to be reaching an audience 10 or 100 times bigger than we've ever had before. Many of them probably don't use BlackBerry, so we have to give them something that they're going to love. They were trying to iterate from the existing platform to something where the market was going, whereas Apple had defined that market. Um, you know, Rim was great. Rim was a great innovator when it was innovating and it was a terrible follower. I wonder if someday we'll say that about Apple, that Apple is a great uh, was a great innovator, but a terrible follower. I mean, that's a that's a you know that, that that's a hard turn for for anyone to make. And, it's hard to maintain that for for certainly as long as Apple has, but yeah, for even as long as BlackBerry had. Yeah. We we did say that about Apple. So Apple was dead on the operating table, like the right. the, the, the Gil Emilio days. We did say that about Apple, and right. we, you know we've done the experiment of a Steve Jobsless Apple. Um, although admittedly, like this, I mean Jobs, I think it's been Jobs. It has been gone for over a decade, and I, you know, is it a fair criticism of that? I mean, I, I, I think it's actually—I don't know, Adam. Are you lining up to get the iPhone 14? You're actually my litmus test for this. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm on the fence of iPhone 14. Um, but <laughs> but you're but you're right. The, the, but some of it's just like, well, how many more cameras can you pack into a phone or whatever? <laughs> um, and I'm not lining up for an, for an Apple Watch too. But you know, I, I'm probably the wrong demographic for that. I don't know. Yeah, I knew when I was sitting with my kids and they're making fun of the Apple ads um, that the, I mean, I think actually, honestly, the fact that Adam's on the fence with the iPhone 14, Sean, that is your strong sell signal <laughs> with respect to, 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 to Apple. Because well, I think, I mean, Adam, I mean, you were 
I, I mean, th- you came up at, as a Mac aficionado. You were very early in on the kind of the resurrection of Apple. You were an early iPhone adopter. I mean, I think you're a fair... I mean, if you're saying, I mean, for months, I know that you thought I was insufferable talking about this iPhone that was coming and it was going to be an iPod and a phone and all these things. More like you. Enough already. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But yeah, no, I was, I was very into it. A big, big booster. I was still, still using a Mac as my daily driver. But I mean, yeah, you get to say undeniably, Apple, I- independent of the phone or whatever, is doing interesting things and continues to find ways to, to resonate with folks. It's really in their DNA. And one of the things, Sean, that uh, occurred, you know, I, I don't know if it's too far to say, but Mike Lazaridis really felt like the product person, like the person who, was, who embodied yeah. the, the customer. And when it came to the original BlackBerry and, and sort of its follow-ons in this, you know, five or 10-year period, he just nailed it. Like he knew exactly what the customer needed, you know, long battery life. They, these Blackberries lasted for like weeks on a, you know, a single double A battery or whatever it was. I mean, just kind of lunacy, but then he just, it, it, you know, you, you tell these anecdotes over and over again where he doesn't get it. And I think you said his parting words, you know, from the, the Blackberry board were pointing to a, a keyboard a Blackberry variant saying this I get, and then pointing to the, the, you know, the all glass, touchscreen version saying this I don't get I, I thought it was v- very poignant but you know how many trailblazers or innovators have there been like like every innovator's dilemma is about uh, an established organization getting upended but a lot of those established organizations were trailblazers in their day absolutely um, totally you know, even even Amazon you know I um I, I talked to a couple of uh, uh you know people who were very senior in the uh, in the Amazon organization um, in the early 2000s. And, you know, right around 2003, 2004, I think when Amazon's growth rate was, you know, starting to dip below 30%, that's when, um, you know, that's when Jeff Bezos was getting um, nervous, you know, and, and I think started to realize that, you know, we need to find digital versions of everything we sell. And um, out of that sort of w- worried period came kind of everything that's defined Amazon's true growth from a you know, seller of books and DVDs and so on to the all encompassing tech superpower that it is today. And uh, of my understanding, you know, this company, which was not even 10 years old at that time and still an innovator and still driven by the day one mentality, had trouble stocking the sort of new organization within the company that was meant to find the the video versions of what they were going to do the digital versions of everything um so even even the innovator within 10 years it, it's not like everyone was jump leaping to get out of the book selling business or whatever and, and and take on this um take on this unknown new venture within amazon think about that so so you know i mean mike was you know let's not forget and, and this is part of the reason by the way that mike and jim agreed to participate uh with the, to, with the book to the extent that they did they knew that the fall was not a pretty story. They'd lived it. They'd seen the company's name become a laughingstock in the pages of the financial papers. But they felt like, you know, there was a great story on the way up that had been kind of forgotten, uh, undertold. And their sort of arrangement, well, not arrangement, they're, they're said to us, well, you know, we'll talk with you and we'll participate in this book. But we want to know that you're telling the story on the way up as much as you are on the way down because it's an amazing story. And, and we agree. I mean, you know, think about the role that devices played in the average life of the average person, not a tech person necessarily, you know, in, in 1995 or 1996. Totally. Yeah. Our average interactions with technology versus today and how much we live on our phones. And that all happens because of Mike Lazaridis and Jim Balsilli. They This was the fire create, you know, to use that, to, to <laughs> stamp that one to death a little bit, but but the the, the fire creation of, of our era, and it starts with BlackBerry. They were the ones who figured out a way to make handheld devices compelling, must-need devices. And it wasn't just an aha moment. It was figuring, it was a number of aha moments and, and selling it and positioning it the right way and getting it in the right hands of the right people at the right time. Totally. Yeah, and, and, and even uh, instant messaging and uh, and even email. I mean, arguably, like the proliferation of email and the, in the integration of email for good or ill into 
our you know constant lives. Uh, you know, you, a lot of credit to BlackBerry for sure. Well, well about, totally. Yeah. yeah. Think about what had happened if they'd gotten BBM right. Like, if they'd gotten BBM right, you know, would it be bigger than WhatsApp? Would it have? Would it have sort of? Yeah. Fended off a lot of the the Me Too's that came up uh, everywhere. Think about that. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it's interesting to think about. It. And I'm, you know, I don't know how much you have looked into the history of digital of DEC, Sean. Um, but I was struck by the parallels between the rise and fall of RIM and the rise and fall of DEC. Um, in that, and with this case, Ken Olson, the kind of the two halves of Ken Olson being played by the by Lazaridis and Balsili. Um, but as with DEC, I do think that part of the, the an, an amazing rise, and for both of these companies, an amazing rise. For both companies, I think that part of the problem was that, and this has definitely happened at Olson at DEC, where spent a lot of time consolidating power in himself, and ultimately could not get moved aside and, was, and stayed with DEC too long. And he, the, 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 the iPhone, the role of the iPhone in the demise of DEC is very much played by the personal computer. Ken Olson dismisses the personal computer. He doesn't believe that personal computing is important. He dismisses it as a toy. I mean, it's like even some of the rhetoric is some of the rhetoric that you hear out of Lazaridis and Balstoe. And the, the, I, I did, so I was left wondering, to me, one of the major problems, because I think you're right, it is very hard for single individuals to be able to kind of span multiple revolutions. And I view part of the problem at RIM is not really having a bench that was ready to take the reins of that company earlier. And to that, like one question I definitely have for you is that the co-CEO model is, I think, nuts. I mean, I don't think the co-CEO model makes any sense at all. But it's certainly, I mean, I will put it this way. It is unconventional and it has not been mimicked. And I don't think anyone is going to look at RIM as a case study for the reason to, to, to mimic it. Did, do you think that the co-CEO model was part of the problem? Um, or is that just a, a, a kind of coincidental here? I don't know. It worked really well until it didn't work really well. You know? <laughs> and, and, and I think, I think that's sort of a, I think that's kind of the caveat for the, for the co-CEO model. I mean, you know, Jim couldn't have done it without Mike and Mike couldn't have done it without Jim. Um, and I don't know if, Rim could have been as successful if Mike didn't have an equal voice and seat at the table as Jim and, and vice versa. And I think they, okay. you know, I mean, it was, it was a great partnership and they would not have gotten to where they were, I think, without it. But, um, you know, people change, companies change, and then, um, you know, all this incoming trauma, um, you know, it, it affects them in different ways. I mean, Mike is a very, you know, he's a religious person. He, he has a lot of, uh, he has a lot of faith, um, a lot of faith in himself, um, a lot of confidence in science. And, uh, you know, Jim's great at uh, deking and bobbing and weaving and, and walking into a situation and playing it as best he can, um, you know, taking the Sun Tzu uh, model with the art of war. I, I, I'm old enough to remember having gone to business school when everyone had a copy of the art of war <laughs> right. tucked under their under their, um, you know, under their arm, but, but Jim might be the only one who actually opened the thing and read it. Uh, <laughs> uh, there were a lot of things I saw people talking around in business school that I suspected they didn't read, but anyway, um, right. um, but, uh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, that model works great until you walk into a situation and you have no answer. Like how do you navigate a patent lawsuit where, um, y you know, y you've run it, you've run out of options and your whole service can be, shut down and Jim had never experienced anything like, I mean, that was a, you know, that was a really damaging ex episode for the company because it really, both of them got knocked for a loop by the, the impact it had on them at, at different points in the, uh, it, you know, in the process, which dragged on for years. Dragged on for years. And it actually brings up another great question, which is the, I mean, the NTP lawsuit, obviously horrifying to, I think anyone in technology, I don't think that, I, I, I can't imagine that RIM was anything other than sympathetic to anyone in technology. This is at a time before, honestly, uh, the John Roberts court had uh, taken on a bunch of patent cases. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why the NTP case uh, couldn't happen some number of years later. Um, but the NTP case does seem to have been, a, I mean, certainly a distraction, but more than that. Do you think that the NTP case uh, played, I mean, if you take away the NTP case, 
does rim have a different outcome um or uh is it, did that toll that emotional toll that it take was that so significant that you think it played a, an essential role in the challenge that rim faced well it's sort of like <laughs> It's like that when you're playing a video game and one of those sort of punch em up games and, and, you know, you sustain a blow and, and you can survive from, but you start to get three, four or five blows and it's, it's, you know, you've lost your turn. I think, I think that was the first of a series of blows. They probably could have recovered from it. I think the stock options scandal was, was probably far more damaging because it got right to the core. And, um, it, you know, it it, 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 that's what sort of severed the relationship more. I shouldn't say severed, but it sort of, <laughs> it struck a blow to the relationship at just the wrong time. And it, and that was an enormous strain on the resources and the attention of the board of directors right when the iPhone is coming along. So I, I think that has the, has the uh, probably lands the biggest blow on that company. When you, when you described uh, Jim and Mike really as two halves of a whole, and it was, it was a really kind of touching portrayal of them, you know, th- certainly through the first half. Um, and, and it, especially with the way you described Basili, uh, Jim Basili, um, I was amazed with the patience and latitude and understanding that he extended to Mike Lazaridis. Um, but it, it, that NTP case must have been, I mean, you talk about it as a blow for Rim to sustain, but for that relationship to sustain in terms of, you know, Jim, you know, it continued to extend that blind trust to Mike. Did that, was that the first kind of chipping away? Certainly, by the time they get to the, the stock backdating uh, option scandal, um, mm-hmm. that seemed to really undermine it. But did that erode that that kind of blind trust or that that two halves of a whole kind of dynamic that they had? I think only in retrospect. I, I think I think you know after the stock options, you know it's like it's like when you have a fight with your partner or something, and then you know you get over it but then years later you're you might fight about something else and you say well you remember the time you said this <laughs> and I think, that never and, happens and, i don't know what you're right. talking about I yeah, no, of course. <laughs> I, i'm speaking hypothetically <laughs> there you go exactly um, but no but i mean you know i think jim felt like when the option scandal came along i think jim felt that um you know he he you know they, they both made mistakes along the way and mike's side of the organization had made mistakes that jim felt he he his side had bailed uh, the company up from, and that was one. But I think at the time it happened, you know, Rim thought they would walk in and, and win this. They'd hired what they thought was great legal, you know, a, a great legal team. They had all this advice. And, um, you know, it was a very technical thing. They walk in and they're supposed to recreate um, the wireless system, I think using prior art base going back, you know, a, a decade or two. And, um, you know, one of the most interesting things about reading the 11 or 12 days of, uh, of, um, of that case, of the original NTP case, is actually the jury selection. And I was, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, I'm no, not. I know. It's the rocket docket. It's so yeah, bad. Yeah, it's the rocket docket. And, and it's like, you know, you get the impression uh, reading it that if someone, you know, knows almost so much as how to turn on a, you know, save a document in Microsoft Word that they're, they're excluded from the jury. I mean, this was a lay jury of... Oh, people. And they had to, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to litigate. They had to make a decision on a very technical um, set of circumstances put before them. And so Jim, Jim liked to refer to, um, and he still does. He's, he's, Jim will talk your ear off about uh, intellectual property. It's, it's a big issue in Canada as well. And he's been one of the foremost proponents of, uh, you know, the tech industry up here, kind of learning about it and understanding how important uh, IP is. He's helped shape uh, government policy up here federally, still very active on that front. Um, but his view about going into these rocket dockets is it's all about who wears the white hat and who wears the black hat in that sort of, you know, kind of cowboy um, cowboy scene. And, you know, especially with a, a lay jury, who looks like the bad person and who looks like the good person? And here was Mike Lazarita saying, you know, like, everyone in the jury knew that BlackBerry was a hot thing and, you know, they were reading stories about how it was doing well and sales were going up and, and Mike was poor mapping and, and trying to make it seem like they were, you know, less successful, a little more vulnerable than they actually were. And, and, and that right off the bat, the jury, you know, they, um, they had some doubts about that. And, but no, I mean, that said the demonstration that they, and this is maybe going a little into the weeds, but the demonstration of the tech was a complete disaster in the court. And that sort of, you know, you can't really recover from that. No one can anticipate that. 
there's no real finger pointing from that. You just sort of pick up and try and try and navigate back to uh, and, and, higher Would you mind recounting that demonstration a little bit? We talk, obviously talk about it in the book, but people may be unaware that this actually did get to to a trial and that this demonstration did go sideways. Do you want to just describe that a little bit? Yeah, it, it's it, you're testing my memory a little bit because it is a bit technical, but basically they had to, they were up against this patent troll. It was actually this 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 hard luck inventor who he was like a Mike Lazaridis who didn't have a gym ball silly, you know, and, and he was he was obviously successful and inventive um, in creating uh, a wireless, you know, in, in trying to succeed his wireless email. But all he was left with was, um, you know, a destitute company, I think, and a, and a couple of patents. And um, so it was it essentially had been an operating company that was reduced to a non-practicing entity. And BlackBerry tried to show in court that um, all the prior art existed prior to this patent uh, to deliver the things that NTP said it had a patent on. And they had this whole demonstration set up, ready to go. And uh, I think they had a problem with the software. Anyway, there was... Um, uh, is what happens when you... <laughs> this well, the, the, way, laugh, the, but... the way you describe it in the book, the... Um... They, they found some existing, some system that claimed to be able to send these e emails um, and they do this demonstration. And then I guess in cross-examination or something, Sean, uh, the, the attorneys see the timestamps yeah. on some of these files on the computer and they're like two weeks ago. Yeah, that's right. And and the and the person they brought in to demonstrate it had said, "Well, I couldn't get the earlier <laughs> the earlier version of this to work." And oh, the yeah. judge got really mad. Well, well and Andy said, uh, you know, that uh, not only could I not get it to work, but these helpful RIM engineers came in and helped me get it working. And, yeah, oh, and so oh that whole goodness. demonstration, which was going to be the centerpiece of their case, was struck from the uh, struck from the record, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think that it did show kind of a naivete about what the narrative, as you say, it's the rocket docket. This is in East Texas. Again, this is not possible today because of a bunch of, of Supreme Court decisions and reforms that have taken place. But it used to be that you could kind of pick your venue. And in East Texas, they would you'd pick this narrative of this big, bad megacorp is stealing this American inventors, you know, this this farmer who in his shed has come up with this great invention and it's being stolen by the uh, by the large corporation. And, you know, that resonates uh, in East Texas. That resonates in, in a lot of places, but that really resonates. And they errantly tacked right into that narrative and made they, they kind of made themselves out to be who the, the kind of the cartoon that NTP was trying to portray them as. And it was just disastrous for them. Yeah, and, I, and I don't think any of them knew what they were walking into. And again, they had, they had good legal advice. You know, they, they right. hired, well, I shouldn't say they had good legal advice. I don't want to be a judge of whether they had good or bad. They, <laughs> they hired, but the, they It was hired, expensive. Oh, they hired, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, they did what you would expect um, a company to do in that situation, which is to, to bring in a big name and, Anyway, but, uh, and I think for whatever it's worth, I mean, a lot of other folks learned from that. Um, and, you know, Adam and I were kind of in the uh, in the extras of a cast of thousands in a very large patent suit between and uh, between NetApp and Sun. And uh, NetApp tried to initiate this litigation in East Texas. And one of the absolutely glorious things that Sun's counsel did as part of this was a countersuit that had a bunch of patents that NetApp was, was violating, but then also a California statute, an anti-competitive statute. And as a result, when, and they sued them in San Jose and countersued in San Jose. And when the courts kind of looked at this, they're like, well, we've got you know, these federal statutes, but then we've got this California statute that we got to go deal with. So we're going to toss this thing into San Jose, which was considered to be a total win because it's harder to find that jury in San Jose than it is to find it in East Texas. Um, and of course, the, the, but th this whole, and I think that actually, honestly, the NTP suit and the damage that that did really cast a shadow and, and, and caused a bunch of really, and, all, and, and then the death of Rehnquist on bluntly because but Rehnquist never took a patent case. So for 30 years, patent law had effectively stopped. Um, and when Roberts became the Supreme court justice, he was taking a bunch of patent cases and a bunch of nine O decisions. So that, that totally changed. And so I think that there's a bunch about that case that cast a long shadow. Hmm. 
the, so the, the and then the options backdating you said so is that that's interesting that you feel that is like the options scandal is kind of the death blow of their relationship is what it sounds like is it yeah it, well because both of them you know i think mike had and this probably gets to the heart of the dual ceo thing you know because because mike had always felt like mike and jim always felt like they could trust the other part the other side of the business to the other person wholly and completely you know i mean jim never set foot in the lab and mike trusted him to to be a shark and do his thing and mike um mike felt that jim had you know that the options back then he didn't understand this stuff he just said okay let's do it he he didn't know he was even though he was co-ceo he wasn't sort of up to speed on this stuff and i think he felt like jim had put the company at risk and when he had a chance uh, and, and Jim felt that he took um, he, he asked for leniency, um, which he felt was a betrayal of the partnership. So each of them felt betrayed by that, but they, they couldn't talk about it for months. So this sort of built up between them. And when they could when they finally the all the last matters were settled with the, uh, you know, with the securities uh, commissions in the United States and Canada, Jim finally went in and and confronted Mike and um, they had a very emotional conversation. Uh, but from Jim's recollection, Mike's uh, Mike had less of a recollection of it. But you know, it, it didn't lead to a really satisfying outcome. And 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 people said afterward, you know, you know, they kind of kept their fights to themselves a bit. But um, yeah. but they but they would say, you know, it was like you could tell mom and dad weren't getting along. And that was really <laughs> yeah. like the long oh, you could of, you could definitely tell that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so all right, so that's, I mean, a bunch of things that are interesting there. One, first of all, and I think this is kind of a persistent theme. Uh, you have this outstanding reportage from these intense conversations that Lazarus and Valsili have with one another. And I've often found that one of them recalls it better than the other. The, <laughs> the, 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 the aggrieved party always seems to have a vivid recollection of it. And, and it flips. Like they're not, there's not one aggrieved party. For the, and the other one is like, yeah, I'm not sure if they remembered it or not. <laughs> Which, of course, I mean, it's as it is in any long-term relationship. But on the options back, let me ask you kind of a, 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 a more of a, a, a kind of a moral framework question. Did they disagree? Because honestly, it feels like they did about whether what RIM did was right or wrong in, in a moral sense, not a legal sense. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I, uh, I always hate when people say that to me, so I'm sorry for saying that to you. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's a really interesting question. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I actually like that. I'm not. I don't get. I get actually get offended when people say, "Actually, I agree with Brian." That's what drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, like everyone was doing it. Um, everyone was doing it. So it's it's is it right or wrong if everyone's doing it? And I mean, the thing is, I think they were. You know, they they ended up sort of being kind of a the, the you know the the. So the kind of sacrificial lamb on yeah, the yeah the head on the pole at the at the entrance to the medieval city you know kind of warning <laughs> warning all visitors and and i think part of the problem was because this was an email company um you know the, 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 oh, the yeah, oh, so they, they, all the receipts were right there the, yeah. the receipt, yeah. we, 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 we are a receipt gathering company we have the receipts yeah they, they left they left a they left a, an extensive as it were a digital paper trail that made it relatively easy for patient regulators to to sift through um, and and make their case and you know I guess one could cynically say claim their victim you know hold up their hold up their 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 prey as it were for the, well for the yeah I mean the same. I mean victim is a bit strong right because I mean they I, I, so my read is that that Lazaridis knew at some level that like yes everyone was doing it but everyone I mean everyone was wrong everyone was actually doing something that was actually wrong and the and Balsili believed that, like, actually everyone was doing it and we are being selected as a victim. And because everyone was doing it, that, like, that kind of takes morality out of it. That was my read. Is that not, is that not a, am I overreading there, do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a fair read. I mean, you have to remember also what the, what the early 2000s were, like 99, 2000. I mean, oh, you know, I remember. the market was, <laughs> like, how the hell do you price options when your stock is going from, you know, 60 to 20 to 120 to seven to 18 to a thousand, you know, like how on earth do you price, do you price options? And I think that was a, I think a lot of companies struggled with it. Obviously the solution they came up with was not a great solution. Yeah, but you're right. The, the temptation must've been so high when you say, Hey, if I had joined two weeks later or two weeks earlier, you know, I'd be talking about a, you know, five X multiple on, on, you know, the, the, the difference here. 
So can well, we just was, move this around? It, it was a big struggle. I think a lot of companies, uh, and I think a lot of companies had that. I mean, I was actually covering this stuff um, 20, 20 some years ago, and, and it was it was everywhere, everywhere in the tech industry. And, and I think well, Britain was just one player. It, yeah, actually, for whatever it's worth, uh, Sun, I'm not, no, I do not know for a fact that there wasn't, but I do not think that Sun actually got caught up in it. It was, it was in a lot of places, but I think... A lot of places. Okay, not it, it, everywhere, but a lot of places. Well, but I think because people say like, oh, everyone's doing it. It's like, well, not actually everyone is doing it. And, the, and those folks that aren't doing it are actually trying to abide by the law. And there's a little bit where... I, by, by, by regulation, anyway. And I mean, it was, it, I think people felt like they were in a gray area and you could argue that maybe they were. I think that because this was an area where there hadn't been much regulatory enforcement, but um, it's, it's, so Tom is, so Tom Lyons got his hand up. Tom, Tom, just to introduce Tom to you, Tom was one of the early employees um, at Sun Microsystems and is a regular around here. So Tom, welcome. Any thoughts for Sean? Thanks to be on, good to be on. I was going to comment that the, the ironic nuance of the backdating thing is that it, the backdating wasn't illegal. It was the failure to report it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's and, a good and, point. And, yeah. and, and so everyone was doing it. It's like, okay, everyone was doing it. But the subtlety was you got to report it, which nobody, nobody did, to my knowledge. And the, the, the sacrificial victim out here was Brocade. We went after them. Yeah, interesting. And, and that, you know, Honestly, like good on the regulators. I mean, the way they kind of pro they they know what is going to get everyone else's attention is, which is, I take one of your peers, and if I actually enforce this to the full letter of the law, full letter of the regulation, with one of your peers, it's going to wake everybody up, and it did. Like, the, I don't think options backdating is not something that is, I think, as commonly engaged in. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, you know, the other thing is, I think Jim kind of understood a little bit more. You know, again, the art of war thing, sort of navigating, I, you know, and, and you look at any securities exchange commission action and there's often a big dance and, and the perp walk and all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, you know, everyone's looking at a settlement, probably. I, I'm thinking is, 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 is the strategic thinking there, you know, you know, at the end of the day, everyone gets to walk away. Well, I, 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 you can't really say that, actually, with SEC stuff, because. There are there have been directors and and uh, executives who've been banned from uh, from running companies, so that that's not always true. But yeah, I, and also Adam and I dealt with an IBM exec who was doing due diligence on an acquisition of Sun and feeding that due diligence to his uh, girlfriend, who was then feeding it to her boyfriend, who was then right. trading on it, and he went to jail. Yeah, no, kids, so, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Of so it, there are there are definitely limits, but um, so it, you know, one question I want to ask you about a, a, a figure that that features pretty prominently in the book, to the point that I think that you, you know you've even called him the the, the third leg of the rim stool in early days is Larry Conley. Um, so Larry Conley comes from Motorola, uh, and I, interestingly, like uh, I mean, you view him as a a. a a new kind of engineering discipline arriving at RIM. I wonder if you could speak to, to that arrival, what it meant for RIM, and then what his subsequent departure and actually re-arrival uh, met for RIM some years later. Yeah, well, he's, he's, he's old school of fire and brimstone. I mean, he's from, he's from vintage Motorola, good old fashioned Motorola, um, where they made tough managers who, uh, you know, there was a performance culture and, you know, he joins this sort of unruly startup that's um, that's figured out how to make people, um, you, you know, how to make wireless email popular. But is, you know, it doesn't have one year targets. Um, you know, if you ask someone when's this product due, someone will say six months, another person will say two years. And, you know, he brings in an operating discipline that is uh, that is probably essential and needed at the time and is um you know, I think as an engine for the company's growth, but it comes at the cost of, you know, a, a lot of the, the early culture, right? You know, the, the, yeah. the early engineers. Um, and I'm sure that happens in a lot of companies um, that grow up from a scrappy, young, um, uh, placeful kind of maverick and then outlaws into, a, into something much bigger. And um, the thing that, that Larry had was um, a pocket veto. He was the only other person in the company who could walk into a meeting and say this is the way it is, and everyone would know that he was representing Jim and Mike. 
Um, the problem was that, you know, he wanted more of that. You know, he wanted to have the role of, of president. He wanted to be formalized as the one person um, underneath them. But they each had their own COO. <laughs> Which is, I mean, and, that is, a, I mean, the co-CEO model, okay, co-COO model as well. It's like, wow, okay, that's... Uh, yeah, and, and he and Don Morrison, uh, Jim COO, could not have been more different. I, I mean, it, Jim was, you know, or, um, uh, Don was a lovely guy, and, uh, you know, everyone would come to his, uh, onto his couch to sort of sit down and talk about the world and, and, and lay out their problems. He was, the, he was a, a gentle father figure for a lot of people and, and, and much admired. Larry was tough and respected. Um, mm. Probably not loved, but definitely respected, wildly respected. A lot of people, yeah, I'd never heard of him actually uh, before we started doing, uh, before we started working on the book. But everyone said, "Oh, if you could get Larry to talk, he would be, uh, he he would be great." And um, and and you know, because he couldn't get that one position which he thought the company really needed, I think he got a little bit frustrated over time. He was getting into his sixties; he had his knees replaced, and and decided it was time to, to leave. And this was right at the time when things are, the wheels are starting to get ready to fall off on RIM. And, and they, they needed a Larry Conley more than ever. Not yeah, that it not. necessarily would have fixed everything, but I think it would have, it, I think things really spiraled out uh, quite badly after he left. And I think he would have, he would have, I mean, maybe the playbook never would have seen the light of day um, or been as much of a disaster <laughs> if he'd been around at that time. Yeah, interesting. Well, and so you, as you kind of get to that, like Conley's departure and them, you know, with the storm first, and then uh, you know the playbook later, trying to respond to to Apple and the iPhone. I do feel that that, and I love your take on this. Um, you know, Andy Grove is famous for saying that only the paranoid survive. It, you definitely see it in the way that Intel conducted itself under Grove, for sure, in that Intel would have this huge roadmap lead over AMD when AMD was dead. And they would present you their ongoing roadmap. And it was like, God, nobody tell them they have no competition because this roadmap is so aggressive, even though it actually doesn't need to be. Like, they could be relaxing and they weren't. This is back before Intel it had its own... Uh, its own decline. Um, but it, it doesn't feel like RIM had that same sense of paranoia. They certainly, and I, I, I don't want to, you know, it's hard to take Apple seriously. A lot of people didn't think Apple w was a serious contender, but they certainly did not take Apple seriously. It, 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 is that a fair read? I mean, do you think that they, did they have a culture of arrogance with respect to, to Apple? And did that did that impede their ability to really respond to Apple? I, I think probably one of the one of the big mistakes they made was was misreading or, or, or not taking into account how much the carriers would bend, um, and it, that changed the game probably more than anything. Because again, you have to think like like the carriers were carriers were always terrified of becoming dumb pipes. Although, like, what's wrong with being a dumb pipe when you can? You know, you can pay five percent dividends a year, but but the carriers are always worried about becoming dumb pipes, and so they never really allowed any of the you know the the, the early two thousands vintage smartphone providers, RIM included, to 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 have much of an app store. Um, and, you know, like who would ever think that the mighty carriers would ever bend the way they did? And so, RIM never needed to develop an app store. It never needed to develop um, a sophisticated operating system beyond the let's face it, glorified uh, digital radio that was the RIM operating system because they'd beaten more complex operating systems that the best of Silicon Valley threw at them in the late 90s and early 2000s. And the impression Mike had at the time was that eats up a lot of battery and it's going to eat up a lot of, um, a lot of um, the network space. And he was right about both of those things. Um, it, but, but the fact that the carriers then, you know, the carriers who are scared of Apple... Uh, because Apple has partnered with Sprint, right, on the iPod, and I think that sort of set the game going. So um, AT&T kind of gives them carte blanche and lets them do an app store. And then Verizon, by the time um, by the time they do the Droid, says to, you know, hey, you do an app store as well. That would have been unthinkable um, for, you know, for RIM just a few years earlier. And, um, and so they'd never had to worry much about apps because the carriers never wanted them to have much in the way of apps. And suddenly... It's like suddenly the, the, the ground gives way underneath you in a way you never would have expected. 
and that's, right. and, that's yeah. and that's the carriers teetering. And so, you know, if they had thought, you know, if you go back to 2001, 2000, and, and you tell Jim and Mike, you know, in seven years, the way the carriers are going to be is going to change. And uh, they're going to let Silicon Valley in the front door. And Silicon Valley is going to start to call the shots. I think RIM does things a lot differently. But I, huh. think, they, I think they believed, um, you know, and we're used now to for 15 years of disruption of Silicon Valley coming in um, and, you know, taking over the car business and taking over the healthcare business or, or trying to, you know, all these areas where Silicon Valley is disrupting everything at every turn. And it wasn't like that, you know, and, and, and you wouldn't necessarily have thought that the carriers would have been so vulnerable to, and, and, and would have been kind of handed the keys to, to Google and Apple to, change, to, to kind of change the rules. So I'm really curious about that because I feel in 2001, if you had said that Apple was going to be the tip of that spear, I don't know if they would have taken you seriously. It reminds me of that scene in Back to the Future when he talks about the Ronald Reagan being president in 1955. It's like, Ronald Reagan, the actor? <laughs> uh, it's like, you're clearly not from the future. And I, I, I mean, I kind of wonder the same thing because, you know, something that I had mentioned that was, that was very striking to me when I was talking to, you know, this, this very weird day at RIM that ended in this meeting with uh, Balsili and Lazaridis, where people kept talking about the toy company and of uh, this like menace of a toy company. And I could not figure out, I mean, it was embarrassing. I literally, it, it took me like three meetings to figure out who the toy company was. And what, I was like, Toys R Us declared war on Canada in some ways <laughs> that I'm not aware of. And, you know, is, is Toys R Us trying to fish out the cod stocks on the Great Banks? Because if anything is going to get under a Canadian fingernails, I know that's going to do it. Um, but the, as it turns out, the toy company was, they mentioned, oh, the Cupertino toy company. And I was like, wait a minute. Sorry, is the toy company Apple? It's 2011. This company is devouring you right now. They are not a toy company. They are an apex predator and you are their prey. And I, I just I just wonder if you would have been able to communicate the urgency in 2001. But you think that you, you might have been able to. It's hard, but remember, there was a lot of uh, innovation that happened that enabled the iPhone to come out, and it wasn't—it wasn't a great iPhone either in two thousand. No, like right? <laughs> yeah. No, in fact, I get to re rehash all these arguments I had with Adam, telling you why his <laughs> device was terrible. It's true, but but I, but I think that's you know that's one of the timeless lessons I think uh, that that everyone should take from the innovator's dilemma and always think about. Like, if you're an incumbent and someone comes along. You know, and they're and they're you know, let's say you're an enterprise, and they're they're going after SME, or or someone's coming in with like a bargain basement product, and you say, well, they'll never compete with us. Well, no, they're they're claiming a piece of the market that you're not interested in. That's going to fuel their revenue and growth, and 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 who knows what that company can become. And I don't think anyone should ever. And it's it, it, you know, it's a combination of only the paranoid uh, survive and the innovator's dilemma. Like you always have to be watching. And never dismiss anyone coming in with this quote unquote toy or the 1.0 version because that's going to get better or the tech might change, you know, the algorithms might improve, the, the chips might get faster and, and things that you rule out. Well, I, I don't need to tell you guys this. This is, this is your life. You know, this is, oh, you, yeah. you've lived it, but you've had, we lived this. Yeah. We, I mean, that, right. I mean, Adam and I literally lived it because we were at Sun at the height and and we're at the like, boy, this X80, why would one buy an $800,000 Sun server when you could buy a, an X86 for a lot less money? And as it turns out, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm innovation explaining here. Sorry, guys. Oh, no, 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 spot no. On. Spot it, on. It, it is it is spot on. And I think that you're right that that is I feel that is actually the you know, there are a bunch of like lessons in here. But the big lesson from this, I think, is, Sean, I think you exactly nailed it. The big lesson is you really do not dismiss that technology on the horizon. Um, you do so at your own peril. And by the time you're actually estimating it properly, it may be too late to really, uh, to truly and meaningfully change direction. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, one of my, one of my sort of takeaways is, you know, good products help you do something you were doing before more effectively and efficiently. But great products can, you know, significantly transform how a task is performed to such an extent that it reorders the world, uh, you know, reshapes human behaviors and economic activity. You know, you get to set the ground rules and standards and establish leadership in the global race, but the race doesn't end. And <laughs> on comes the next incumbent and, you know, rinse, repeat uh, and so on.
Absolutely. And it, this was indeed, it was a great product. It was a revolutionary product. The book is superlative. Uh, I just cannot recommend this book strongly enough. Adam, hopefully you didn't think that I, I, uh, I, I know you, you might actually agree with Brian on this one, that this book is actually an, an yeah, extraordinary yeah. book. Folks, you heard it here. I actually agree, agree with Brian. <laughs> uh, well, and, thanks, and, and we, we, we would be remiss if we did not mention that this is going to be a feature film. <laughs> this is, uh, which is extremely exciting. It must be just, I mean, that must be very exhilarating for you, Sean, to have a book that is being used as the basis for the big screen. It must be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a, a pinch me moment. I mean, obviously, we've, we've known about this for some time, and, you know, it's, it hasn't been our news to share. But, uh, you know, I did get to visit the film set in uh, Hamilton, which is about 45, 50 minutes uh, or longer with bad traffic uh, outside of Toronto. And I got to meet the... Um, you know, it's amazing to walk around and, and see this, uh, see the set and like they, you could tell they put a, a ton of effort into recreating the look and feel of Rim at Blackberry at various stages. And I, I got to meet uh, Glenn Howerton, um, the uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia star in character in between takes as Jim Balsillie, you know, with the, um, oh, wow. the pad and the tie-in. And, and, you know, it, it's like two minutes. I, I don't know if you know many actors, but you catch an actor between two takes and, you know, they are in the zone. They are, they're in character. And I walked in and, um, you know, it took my breath away because it, it felt like meeting Jim Balsilli 15 or 20 years ago. Wow. So and you so, really so nailed it. Yeah. yeah, that was neat. I mean, um, and, you know, it's great to think, you know, we wrote this story or we put a lot of effort into it. And it's nice to know that, um, you know, it still resonates seven years later and it will reach a, a new audience and they'll, they'll tell their story their way. And, and, um, you know, hopefully the film will be a success and, and, and bring more, more readers to the story and, and, and just more interest in this, in this improbable, great little Canadian company that started, you know, above a bagel store, the old, the old cliche and, and changed the world until it was disrupted itself. It's, uh, it, it, you know, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to write the story and, and yeah, I, I take some uh, some great satisfaction knowing that that the story will get to be told uh, in a new medium for. for well, well, the the story will endure. I will tell you that most people would not know who Data General was were it not for Tracy Kidder soul of a new machine. Um, so re reportage endures. Um, and I think the lessons from this one are are timeless. Cannot recommend this book strongly enough. Adam actually agrees with me. Um, and so. <laughs> Uh, definitely worth checking out. We're all going to check out. We're, we're going to have to do a, a group watching of this thing when it becomes available. Um, but Sean, I cannot thank you enough for, both for the book. You and Jackie just did such a terrific job and for being willing to, to join us here on, on this circus. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for all of your the thoughtful insight about the, the, the company and the book and the people behind it. Um, just can't thank you enough. No, well, thank you for the opportunity and, and thanks for the interest. I really appreciate it. You bet. All right. Thanks, everyone. We will uh, we, we will see you next time when, just to tease it out a little bit, um, I think, Adam, we might switch it up and do a, a at least a one-off for our European friends. Switch up the time a little bit. Ooh. So, yeah, for a, if you're a European catching this uh, on a recording, I think we might try to do it not at 2 a.m. your time. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, we'll get, to get that out there in the next couple of weeks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye.